Hello, good evening, everyone. Hi, my, um, good evening, uh, good morning, everyone. You know, this is Greg, and I just want to talk to you about a couple of things. One thing I want to tell you about is um, um, I was just kind of going through some scriptures and reading, and today is um, November uh, 3rd, 2020, and so today is Election Day in uh, the United States. And so uh, around the world, when elections happen, it's usually a violent thing, but in America, what usually happens is people usually just be shouting in the streets and, and either ch ch cheering or... Uh, frustrated, upset. One time I went to an event and I was at, at an event and it was a, um, um, uh, it, was a it was a picture event and when I was there um, it was just four years ago when the election happened uh, four years ago and when I was there there was something happened where the um, the crowd went from um, jovial and happy and optimistic to sad and very overwhelmed and um, very frustrated and I said to myself it's, I have to get out of here because I was in the city at the time and I was uh, doing like a part of a photo thing but anyway so um, I want to tell you some a couple things here and there. I was going through um, this book here, and this book I've been reading is called. I'm not going to say it because I'll let you see it because you know what happens. It's the whole algorithms and stuff, you know. So um, <clears throat> I'm just going to let you see it. And this book here, I've been reading this for some time. And so what happens in this book? It has many different things in it, and um, it's been very interesting in, in teaching me a lot about um, what's going on today in our society. And one of the things that I stumbled upon was I was reading this book was that in many levels of life there is a thing called, um, I guess, uh, corruption. And that uh, corruption is where, you know, um, how I determine it, it could be a different definition, but it's something where you, you get power given to you by the people or given to you by, um, um, by the public or some state or some kind of, you know, so you power, and the power you have that's bestowed upon you, you use it to accomplish nefarious things. Be it you might get more money, you might get more um, women, might get more um, fame, and you know, or women or men, I guess it depends. Um, yeah, you might get more um, uh, uh, property or favors, more favors because you're using your status and your name. It's like you know, it's kind of like getting rewards because you're um, um, you're an official as opposed to rewards because you actually did something. And so what happens is like you know, a corruption happens where people do something in terms of getting something else. So. I'll give you something if you give me something. Let's say I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back, kind of a thing, you know. And so what ends up happening is that it really sours the land. The Bible warns about that. It says when when a, when a king is susceptible to bribes, or when a king is susceptible to um, gifts and, and things, what happens becomes lawless. It becomes a thing where they be start doing things that are um, not so good and not so well because they end up being like a lawless type person, and they succumb to gifts and bribes. There was a movie, and I think it's like the last night or something like that. And it had um, what he called Morgan Freeman in it, and it was a king, and the king was a very ruthless king, and there was another one, um, I forget his name, uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name right now, but he's one of the, um, the actors were in it, and in the long story, the, the king was, the, 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 one of the rules were corrupt, and he, Morgan Freeman's character, stood against the, stood against the, um, um, the king, and so incidentally, what happened to him was that he got, you know, killed by the king, and so what happens, the thing about corruption is that, um, one of the things it talks about in this in this book here, and I'll pretty much I'll put a link in the description, but I'll show you the book. One of the things about this book, you know, I, one of the things talks about like how regarding um, uh, things that bother us and things that are inside of us, things that come out of us. What happens is like uh, um, just to be trying to be clear, it says that we have many things inside of us already, and we are very much the things that live inside of us are pertaining to our body. I had this conversation with people at work, and I said to them that, you know, whenever we have a, um, uh, somebody has anything like a, a transplant, a, a, a human to human transplant, like a, you see a kidney or a, or a liver, I guess, or something that, that a human can transport, like a, like an eye or something, that can be transported from one person to another in the event of a, a, do a donor situation. What happens is this, right? Um, your body hates foreign entities. It hates all manner of foreign entities. So it sends out antigens and antibodies to fight them. Well, actually, antibodies to fight them. And it creates antigens to fight and to resist things. So what happens is that over time is that your body will kill that organ. So it's like if you have an organ that's foreign to you, that's not the same DNA that you have when you were when born or that you live with, what happens is that you actually, um, your body will actually kill it. Your body will kill it. So if there's anything, um, our body does not like foreign objects, foreign, foreign entities. So for example, when you get like a uh, the V and you get it stuck into your arm, uh, whatever, you have a foreign entity been inserted into your body. And there's other chemicals in there as well, like aluminum and mercury, thimerosal, there's all the th things there. And your body produces antigens to fight up, off this thing. So what happens in the process of what they're trying to do with the whole V thing is that when they give this to you the shots, it's for you to um, um, produce a less a resistance to a minor dosage of the, of the actual thing. It's kind of like... Um, well, what they've been finding out is this. They, they can't find 
the viruses. They don't have the viruses. They don't have samples of viruses. And <clears throat> so you got to start wondering what are injecting the people. Now, I just made a big statement there, and you're going to ask me, what do I mean by that? And I really encourage you to read this book if you get a chance to, because, you know, he is a doctor, and he can explain this stuff to you uh, <clears throat> better than I can, but the little I can explain to you um, is just this, that um, many times um, they tell you something, and um, the more they tell you about something, the more you start to realize that if you go one step further to look into it, you start finding that there's a lot of holes in it, like Swiss cheese. And the more you go into something, the more you start realizing that this thing isn't true. Um, I had this happen to me in ministry. I had this happen to me in, um, um, in the, pretty much in workplaces and different jobs that I've worked. I find in levels of corruption that's not based upon. So they give you a rule, and they say in this rule, you can't do certain things. And then in the same rule that you say you can't do certain things, they're, doing the, they're breaking it. Like you had the things with Cuomo and his brother. They were just breaking the rules. They're saying that you can't do this as a normal person, but his, his brother going out doing stuff, and he was quote-unquote you know, contaminated with a thing, and here he is going out and meeting people. So he's like a hypocrite. And that's what happens. You just have to find hypocrisy in the, in the organism. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist. And you know, I like dinosaurs. I like dinosaurs a lot, and I, I make them a lot. I, I, have, um, I have lizards, but I um, right here I have a lizard of my, um, my masking tape lizard I've made. One of the things I'm... Um, I like dinosaurs. I like dinosaurs a lot. And um, I have a dinosaur like over here. Um, let's look at that one real quick. Um, this is like this is not a dinosaur, but it's like a dinosuchus, and it's a crocodile made of masking tape and stuff like that. And so this is a creature. And what happens is that when I got into the whole thing with paleontology, I started to understand that really my sister actually she she dissuaded me from it. She said to me, "You know, Greg, that they're all they're all dead, you know." And that's when it kind of hits me that they're, all the dinosaurs are dead. So the thing was, that's one of the things about it was that she explained to me that. And she gave me a perspective that you're going to be digging up bones and, and having to make hypotheses and things like that about creatures that are not alive anymore. But then there came a point where when I looked into it, it was just it didn't make any sense to me because what what's the fun of digging up bones, you know? It's like, you know, like in the Jurassic Park movie, there's a thing on the fir first movie and he's digging up a raptor bones. And it's like, you know, that was a wrong scene, by the way, because you don't, according to, you know, you don't find raptor bones in Montana or, but anyway, that's beside the point. You can't find those bones in Montana, Montana. maybe Dionicus, but anyway, long story short, you can't find those dinosaur bones in that area. But the thing is, like, when they have these things, you're going to be digging up bones and making stories up about how they moved and how they, and then you copy a living creature to try and decipher us to what they look like. And so I, I like dinosaurs a lot. I, I think they're really cool. But what I realize, I understand, I like the animation aspect of it. I like the movement and the animation. And they say, well, that comes from understanding the bones, but they've never, when you look into it, they've never found a complete dinosaur skeleton. They found many complete, many skeletons, but never a hundred percent complete ones. Everything is always a speculation, and the bones that you see in the museums are not the actual dinosaur bones; they're actually casts. Well, some of them, the most completed um, one that they have, it's the most complete dinosaur, like Allosaurus skull, is that of Ebenezer, and they had that in the Creation Museum. Um, there's um, there's other dinosaurs bones and and things like that, but to put together all together. They don't usually have that. And what ends up happening is that you have to get funding from some source. You're not going to get a funding from being a, a, a for being a person who talks about the Bible like I do, right? You're going to get funding for some, some outlandish theory, like, oh, dinosaurs were turned into chickens or something like that. Or dinosaurs um, had feathers or something like that. In order for you to get funding, because otherwise you're going to be like, well, they're dead and they're bones and what's new? And unless you're working for some oil company or something like that, trying to find out where um, oil deposits or rich oil deposits might be, really is there's no job in that. I mean... Maybe there is, maybe, you know, not to knock all you uh, paleontologists out there doing your thing and making your stories, but the bottom line is that, you know, you're making stories and you guys are getting money to do something that, you know, it's like you get challenged by other site, um, um, uh, other paleontologists, but the bottom line is that it's one of those things where there's a lot of room for corruption there. You, you all of a sudden find dinosaur bones. And another thing, too, they say Chinese can actually make dinosaur bones. They've done it. They actually can go to a website and find it. For like a million bucks, you can actually get a dinosaur bone. <clears throat> You know, I was thinking about getting one myself, or even making one, because, you know, why not just make your own dinosaur bones? Because I, I can do that. I, can, I have a 3D printer over here. I can print my own dinosaur bone. And so I might just end up doing that, because, you know, why not? But the bottom line is, like, because they say that it's too heavy to, to mount and stone and all that stuff, and all you have to make casts of it, and a lot of things you can do. But I didn't come here just to fight about that. I came here to point out there's many different things that you find. The higher you go, the more corruption you'll see. The more situations you see about life, the more corruption you'll see. So it's like... One of the things is, like, wherever there's money to be had and wherever there's power influence, there's corruption. And, w and why is that? At first, I, I was thinking about, like, you know, is it because the Bible talks about how we have sin. All of, all of, for all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sin. For all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has sin. And what sin is, is missing the mark of God's perfection. 
See, when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought death to the whole world. Not only did they bring death, they brought brought moral death, they brought spiritual death, they brought you know, um, um, you know, um, physical death, physical death, moral death, spiritual death to us. We were um, we die spiritually. You know, our the relationship that God had with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve's relationship to God was gone. They, they, they couldn't talk to God directly anymore. I mean, it was it was a friendly relationship. They would just talk to God daily. God made them in His image, and here we are today, struggling just to find out, you know, who we are and what we are about. Then it's like moral decay. It's like Adam and Eve's first child, Cain, killed their second child, Abel. You know, I mean, that went from really fast. I mean, you know, they went from perfection in a perfect garden with no sin to having their firstborn kill their secondborn. I mean, you know. Then it's like you know, and also. Um, uh, spiritual decay. There's an aspect where it's like, you know, let me kill this thing real quick. There's an aspect where it's like, there's an aspect where you have um, spiritual, um, you have a moral decay where our society continues to go deeper and deeper into all kind of debauchery. You know, you have this thing where, for the most part though, you're thinking that, you know, you're helping out a situation, but eventually you're, you're, you find that you're not helping the situation at all, you're just making it worse. And then, the thing is, if you're a whistleblower, you become troublesome to the people who want to keep the corruption going. So, example, now you have this thing here we're going through, all of us, right? This is election day, this is the day where we make a decision to cast our, our ballot, cast our vote, right? And so when we cast our ballot, cast our vote, we're hoping to be able to um, to put a you know decision into something. What's interesting, interesting about a, a president right now is that he cannot be bought or sold. He has actually made all his money, and he went in as a billionaire. And uh, pretty much as a billionaire, he's already made his money and had his riches and has his fame, and he's well known. So he's kind of like uh, there's no explanation in a sense to um, he can be bought or sold. So the thing is like he has his own area. I mean, maybe he can be like he wants fame, maybe he wants power. But the things that, that hold us normal mortals down, he's already achieved those things. So he's like, he doesn't need that anymore. So he's actually doing something or trying to do something, maybe to leave a legacy, maybe to really help the situation. But one of the things they found is that he was actually one of the few that actually went to the March for, March for Life. And I was there, and um, my wife and my kids and I, we went to the March for Life in January. <clears throat> and we were able to see January 24th, and we were able to see him there. And so yeah, out of all the presidents who have ever been present who, who say they're pro-life and things like that, he was actually one of those to be there. Now, <clears throat> now... If certain people can be bought or sold if they know you can give benefits to your family but if your family is well taken care of you know there's no it's like you know there's a hesitation it's like you have a job and you're like okay well you know i gotta go work this job i gotta do what my job tells me but if you have more money than a job you're like you know i don't need this job i, I can just do this and so i can really focus on things that i that can try and make people's lives better and so the thing is like when you have it like um in a situation with him here he is faced with this and he can do stuff but you know, he doesn't have to be, in a sense, corrupt like we we regular people who have jobs, who need money, who have to pay our phone bill at the end of the month, who have to, you know, get food, who have to, I mean, make sure that, you know, our, our bills are paid, you know, and take care of our family and, and things like that, and also keep, you know, and do all the stuff we have to do. They have that taken care of, that department taken care of, so they can actually focus on stuff. It's almost like, if, if anything, they should actually have where politicians aren't paid to be politicians, or politicians don't need the money. So they can't be bribed, and that's one of the things I think is really good in terms of keeping people from corruption. Because the second you have an opportunity for somebody to fall into a temptation, a temptation to be um, to receive like um, receive a benefit or a bribe or some money for you know for what they're doing, what ends up happening is that they will fall into that temptation. They will fall right into it because they'll say, "Well, my kid needs this, or my wife needs this, or I need to get this." And as long as I have a I need or I need or I want, there's an opportunity for corruption. Now. Uh, some things I wanted to write about is like, you know, there's an aspect of powerlessness that we might feel. I mean, there's many things. I talk harped on dinosaurs a lot, and I, I like dinosaurs, I really do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the things is that, you know, about life is that the more you think about life, the more you, life, in a sense, makes you think. And so, in this book here, um, one of the things I wanted to share with you um, about it was... <clears throat> It, taught, it touched on many times the things that we'd looked at, like, for example, like polio, or looked at things like, for example, um, uh, different sicknesses. The, he talks about in this book that there's a physical ailment or physical poison that causes this thing that we look call a, vir a viral um, infection. So he's saying that, you know, many things that are in our lives are not because of a virus or a little microbe that hurts us. It's because the, the environment is poisoned. So, for example... They have bombarded us with nothing but fear. They have, they have hit us with fear every single day from March, um, was it, March 15th to the present. They have bombarded us 
Well, you should be this because you're gonna kill grandma. You gotta put this mask on because if you don't, you're gonna, gonna, you're gonna, somebody's gonna die. You know, and so if you don't do this, so they, they constantly harped on this and they put the numbers up every single day. Now, I, I think what it was was because they lost ratings so much for the whole Mueller, um, um, Mueller scandal thing, you know, and pretty much like the Russian collusion and the Mueller, scan, Mueller, Mueller investigation thing. And they, they lost so much credibility and so much, um, um, a focus because they were just putting that forward every single day and they were just, they did it without concern. They were like, 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 I don't know why they did it like to the way they did it. It's just like, it's like, you know, you know, they say there's something wrong when somebody has to keep reminding you about it, like these, these, um, like artists and fan, uh, artists and stars and stuff like that. If they have to keep reminding you about their ability, these stars, like these pop culture stars, and they'd be like, oh, I'm here, listen to my, my new album, that means they need you, right? And so the thing is, these people, they, they give us such, these, um, mainstream media give us so much information, bombarding us continuously, that we were at the point where we were like, just everything, they got it into the heads of the people. Now, when the very beginning, they had started getting into my mind, I started thinking that this can't be real because, you know, they've lied about everything else and so it can't be real. And then, then I got to the point where I started believing it was real. And then I got to the point where I said I have to go and see for myself. So my wife and I and, and the kids, we would go out and we'd go to different hospitals here in New York. And we'd go all around the hospitals and go see them and take pictures and we put videos up. You can see our videos on, um, on Facebook, uh, on, Instagram, um, on YouTube there, about all the ones that we, places we went to. And we actually went there and took a video. And we went to, to see the Mercy Ship. We went to see all these different things. And it was empty. It was not a... It was, there was nobody. There was nobody falling dead in the street. There was nobody like that we can see. Um, lines and lines and lines of people. There was. It was quiet. It was a ghost town here in New York. And we were like, I cannot believe this. this what's going on? And then so we began to see that you know, and the job I worked at, we had a lot of people that were from uh, Asian descent. That pretty much, I was like, okay, you know, if if anybody's gonna have it, I'm definitely gonna see somebody who has it. And never had I seen anybody who had it. And so I would write on my Facebook page, I have ne met, met, never met anybody, but somebody was like, oh, I had it and recovered, or somebody had it and then they died, and I was like, really? Wow. And so when we looked into more and more stuff, the more stuff you take to look further into it, what ended up happening, you start learning that they had other things wrong with them. Like they had, um, they had this thing called comorbid comorbidities. So those that had, so it was like saying that, oh, this thing tipped them over the scale. Now, I was like, okay, this doesn't make any sense because I started learning about this thing called exosomes, right? And I mentioned before about exosomes in my previous videos. And an exosome is something where your body produces something, and it, what it does, it's already inside of you. Your, 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 um, your, you have a microbiome inside of you. You have your probiotics and things that work well with your body. Now, you see, if you take a foreign entity and you put it inside your body, your body will fight it. But your body also has many, many millions of millions of bacteria and fungus and, and, um, and viruses and or exosomes that live inside of us and what happens is that whenever there's a sickness or an injury or insult or some kind of stress they get produced there's a production and made and they'll find them certain kind of, of things and they say that what happens is like I was listening to Dr. Andrew Kaufman and he's a really cool guy um, and he's um he, he's also mentioned here in this book as well and in the book he mentions about the whole thing with exosomes I didn't completely finish the book yet I'm up to almost chapter two but um, I've been reading it for very slowly and taking a lot of notes and stuff and um, some of the things I, I, I wanted to say was that um you have things in your body, and when you start hitting your body with antibiotics, it's like my, my mom had, um, um, she had, um, she died of cancer. She had ovarian cancer, and um, she died of it. Before, they did that, before she died, they gave her, like, mega doses of chemotherapy, and that's where my hatred for um, the whole thing with uh, chemotherapy came to be, because it's like, you know, in a cancer society, and all that became to be, because, like, they, there, when I learned there was a doctor named Dr. Lorraine Day, and she had breast cancer, and it was starting to, to metastasize, she found out that there are causes, physical causes, that give us physical cancer, physical injuries. And so, just like how Adam and Eve sinned against God, and immediately their, their lives went from being um, cool with God to being at war with God. Same thing will happen. The Bible said, because Adam sinned, death entered this world. You know, death entered through Adam's sin. When Adam disobeyed, he brought death to everyone. But the Bible talks about how Jesus came and he gave life to everyone, and that we have a chance for eternal life if we believe in him. But the thing is, Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve, Adam, Adam and Eve sinned against us, sinned against God, and, and brought us down with them, they brought physical death to us. And this physical death is, is some of the results of the, the stuff that hurt us, you know, the, the ailments and the sicknesses that we get. And so when our body goes into a kind of a toxic thing, these things inside of us go to try and help, or try to decompose it or break it down. Because, you know, they had a thing with um, the whole thing with, um, uh, in this book mentions about, like, uh, Louis Pasteur. And a lot of the things, when they try and find these, these contagions, where they've never been able to find contagions, like you go from, um, take one thing, a contagion has to be, you have to have the situation where one person has it, this person does not have it. You have to have this person be able to take their information or whatever they have and put it into this person, and that person has the same identical thing as the person who gave it to them. 
Now you can take a third person and give this one person to give it that one as well. And now they can have the same exact thing as this one. That's how contagion is proved. But contagion has not been proved that way. And that's sort of the, one of the arguments in this book. It says that there has been no proof of contagion. What happens is that you have a kind of thing like a cancer thing. I mentioned this before in many of, um, many of my, my videos where like, it's like a cancer thing. If there's a radiation leak and there's a, a cooling tower explodes down the block, everybody in the community is going to have the same quote-unquote contagions looking cancer outbreak. They're going to have inflammation of their thyroids. They're going to have all kinds of problems, lymph nodes and all that stuff. They're going to have sicknesses that, that look like they have a cold or something, when in fact they have radiation poisoning. And so the same thing with us. We have, were bombarded with fear. We were bombarded with a constant bombardment of you, you should be this, you should be this, watch out, watch out, this killer virus, killer virus, killer virus, killer virus. Every day they said it to us. Every day they said it to us so many times that when people believe it, they start developing symptoms. There's a thing called a placebo, and there's a thing called a nocebo. And a placebo is where I give you something I know is not real, and I want you to give it, um, um, I give you something, and it's, the intention is, it's, it's, I give you sugar pills or water pills, and you take it, and it heals you. And there's nocebo, where I don't give you anything, and I say this isn't anything at all, this is not going to help you at all. And you believe it's going to be something and it makes you sick or makes you makes you worse. And so it's one of those things where it's like they took this opportunity and they gave us something that's not really there but something, or something that not really new because they were never able to isolate the, the thing. It says in the CDC, they were never able to isolate the actual, the actual um, samples of it. They have no samples of it and the CDC says it. So you have to ask yourself, what are they, inje what are they going to inject people with in this, this, this um, V trials they're going to start doing? What are, going to be, what are they going to inject people with? What are they going to find for them? And so, the problem is this, like, you know, you begin to wonder, what are they doing? What are they actually doing? Because it's like, if there's no, they, they said this, this is just, they said it only about this thing that we're going through. They said it also about Ebola. They said it about um, Zika. They said it about um, um, HIV, AIDS. They said it about all these different things that people are, are sure that this is how it is. It's not how it is. What they can't end up finding is that there's not, they're not, able to fulfill the Koch, K-O-C-H postulates, or even the reverse postulates. And what happens is that they have to be able to, because the Koch postulates works only for bacteria. A bacteria, yes, you can do a bacterial infection because a bacteria will grow, and you can have a bacteria grow. But bacteria usually grow when, when, when there's some kind of, some, they're like decomposers. Their job is to break things down. They're like flies, you know? And it's like, um, they, they, they go to where there's, um, where there's problems and they try and either to decompose or break it down. Same thing with a virus. Viruses are the same thing, but they call them exosomes. And so, anyway, long of the story is this, like, you have this thing where there's a lot of money to be had in giving people a, a drug. You know, if you give a person a drug, you can, and you, and you can solve a thing, you can make millions and millions of dollars. And there's a room for corruption there. But you're not really helping the people. They say, you know, according to, um, the, um, the, the drugs and, uh, the, 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 um, what's it now? I forget what name it was. They said that there's only way, oh yeah, Cancer Society said it, the only way for, um, um, you to solve anything, pharmaceuticals, it's a big pharma says, the only way for you to have anything solved is for you to have the drugs, a drug to solve a problem, not your natural immune system that solves it. They'll always say that this is not FDA approved and all that stuff, or they'll have a thing, but their drug is approved by the FDA, or their, their whatever it is, there's approved, and then they have their little long list of side effects that they have. I see things in nature don't give you side effects. You're not supposed to. Side effects is that of healing and you're getting better. But when you have like a thing of like, um, um, you know, these, these these pharmaceutical companies, they come in and pharma pharmaceuticals company, they're they're making they're making potions. Okay, they're actually they're they're like doing like witchcraft on people. And it's like the word pharmacy comes from the Greek from the Greek word pharmakia. You know, and pharmakia is, is sorcery. That's the actual word, what it actually means. And this is the thing where it gets to, in my story here, about this, this is about feeling powerless. Because there comes a point where you know these things, and you understand these things, and you can see these things. You see it when the pastors do stuff that's corrupt. You see it when you're in an organization and, and the, the leaders do something corrupt. It's, you see it when you know, the, the, the people that you're working with, they do some, when, when, you're, when your family members do something corrupt, and you try to trust them, or you try and tell people stuff, and what they do is that they just shun you, or they don't listen to you. It, it's where you, you have the Word of God, and you see the Bible, and you see it for yourself, and you understand what the Bible says, and you want to share it with somebody in the street. And what happens, and what happens to me quite often is this. I will tell you something from the Scripture, and you are amazed to meet me. Oh, wow, he's a Christian. He's an actual real Christian, and he believes what he says. He's willing to go out and, and, and street preach. I was a street preacher for six years um, with an organization. He's willing to go out and do that. But even before that, I was out there street preaching. I would go to places and talk to people with the Bible in hand and go talk to people, you know, and I would share the gospel with them. And so the thing is, like, you know, a real Christian who loves the Lord Jesus as a Savior. I, I love Jesus as my Savior. You know, I've known him since I was seven years old. 
And so when I go out there and I'm trying to live as a Christian, I meet other Christians who always start questioning me about their belief system and their weaknesses. And so I, I, I give it, I, not give it, I give them information. I tell them what's up, and then eventually, they, two, one of two things happen. One, they want to know more, and more and more and more and more, until finally they find that little level where you know they're balanced and they feel good about themselves. Or they disregard me altogether. And so the thing is, I'm still the same person. I didn't change. I'm still a believer. But the thing is, like, I meet people who are going to try and force me to, to be like, or act like, or do like, or say whatever they want me to say, so that I can actually be like them, or just get away from them. And so that's kind of the thing about a believer. Now, now I wanted to read you something from the scriptures, but, um, let's see what I was going to say before that. There's, there's a lot of things in this world that when you see the corruption happening, that when you see the corruption, let me go back to my train of thought, if you see the corruption happening, it's like you can only warn people. And my, my, the verse that I came from the Jesus as my Savior was, was through Ezekiel 3.18, right? In the book of Ezekiel. And um, let me see if I can find that for you real quick. Um, I, uh, and so one of the things was that in the... Okay, in the book of Ezekiel, it's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, it says now... It says, um, <clears throat> verse, verse 17, it says, um, Ezekiel is a watchman. And it says, Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from me, from my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked... And he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways. He shall die in his iniquity. Um, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you do not give him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he had done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I require at your hand. Nevertheless, verse 21, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous... that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin. He shall surely live, because he took warning. Also, you have delivered your soul. Now, in that passage, it's like, is a watchman. And I mentioned this before. I think I mentioned before in my, my passages, uh, before in my, some of the other verse, uh, videos I have, there's a, there's a wall, there's a watchman on top of this wall. The watchman, his job is to look over and see that there's an oncoming judgment. If people are coming to attack the city, his job is to make sure he's like a security guard, and he's watching and making sure nobody's coming to attack. For, for example, for some reason, he's like, he sees people coming, he's like, you know, I don't care. I'm going to go, I'm a coffee break now, and people are coming to attack. Well, if anybody dies in the city, that man will be held responsible because he's the watchman. Where was the watchman? Why, why did he warn us? Kind of a thing. So as a Christian, everybody who's a believer in Christ, and my name Gregory means watchman, so it's like, goodness, you know, that's vigilant watchman. So that's even more of a, an emphasis. When I was seven years old, I came to Jesus as my Savior through that passage as the watchman. Long story short, um, re requirement is that I need to warn people that the Bible said to flee from the wrath to come. Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I'm coming again. He's coming again. And he said, you know, to get free from the burden of our sin, how Adam and Eve messed us up and put us on a, on a pathway to death and hell, Christ Christ came and he stopped that. And he made us in a way so he, he took our sin for us. He died on the cross, buried, rose again the third day, and that we have everlasting life. We trust in him. And that's that's the good news right there. The good news that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And not only that, but eventually it'll save your whole family if, you know, God works it so, but eventually that you live the life in front of them. So, you know, all these things here. Um, the bottom line is that, you know, the physical watchman was wa was warned. Uh, he was told by God to warn the people. If he didn't warn the people, he'd be held responsible. Now, you deliver your soul means that your life has been delivered. If you don't, you have to, you're free of the, his blood. That means I, if you die and I warned you, it's on you, you know? But if you if you die and I didn't warn you, it's on me because I could have warned you, you know, to some extent. Like, there's a responsibility, but the Bible says, you know, there's nobody has an excuse. The Bible says God even puts a conscience inside of our hearts. Each of us has a conscience. We have. We know when we do something wrong, we're doing it against the will of God. We know we shouldn't lie. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't curse somebody's mom. We shouldn't curse somebody's father. We shouldn't um, take things that don't belong to us. We shouldn't steal someone's wife. We shouldn't um, kill someone. We know we shouldn't um, covet other people's things and be envious. We know we shouldn't make for ourselves a false god. Because all those things are idolatry, covetousness, murder. Um, taking God's name as a curse word. Using God's name as a curse word, that's blasphemy, right? Making God's name into a thing. When we do these things, God holds us responsible for these things. So, the thing is, we know, we have conscience bears witness, and somebody can come along and says, 
This is how we can be free from this. God, God came to set us free from the burden of sin and shame and strife. And we can have everlasting life we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. So what happens is that what I want to share with you today was um, this verse here. It says, um, <clears throat> put on the whole armor of God. It was um, Ephesians 6. One was the warning. And so I was saying before, people, they listen to me. And they will either accept what I'm saying. And they'll listen and they'll change. Or they'll listen to me and then dismiss it as whatever. You know? Hey, um, it doesn't help that I'm a flat earther too. Because I believe the earth is flat. But the bottom line is like, you know, if you talk to a person to listen to you for some time, and it won't end up happening, they'll just dis dissuade you or dismiss you. And it's not your fault. It's just the way that the, that the mind of people work. And so you just got to be like, you know what? All right. I can only help you so far. If you want to be helped, if you want more information, I got the word of God here. I can share with you. I can explain it to you the best I can. But if you don't want to hear me, don't want to listen to me, that's really on you. And it's not my fault anymore because you know where to go if you want information. You know there's a person here who loves the Lord Jesus as their Savior who's willing to take all the time in the world to sit and talk with you. And, um, you, know, as, you know, as much as I can with my family and, you know, my wife and children and, you know, my own physical ailments to be able to handle it. But the bottom line is that, you know, you have no excuse. You know, you listen to the message, you have no excuse. If God was to take your life right now and you stand before him, he said, why should I let you into heaven? He says, well, I was a good person. No, you can't say that because the Bible says we all have sin. And if God says to you, <clears throat> you know, um, why didn't you turn when you had the chance? He said, well, nobody came to me. He's like, yes, here's somebody here talking to you right now, <clears throat> willing to help you. So, Ephesians 6.10. <clears throat> this is my life verse. And my verse, why is my life verse? Because this is the verse that helps me see that my power is not in myself, but in the power of the Most High God. And <clears throat> God warns us, he tells us different things about how we should be aware. Because the bottom line is that there are things in this world that are set apart trying to destroy us. One of the things is this. Says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not rest against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, what is awesome about this chapter, it talks about something that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There's a verse in the Bible, and it says that we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are mighty God, for the pulling down of strongholds and arguments and every vain thing that exalts itself against, itself against the knowledge of God. And so there's a verse, and it talks about how Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. See, this is a spiritual war, right? And the spiritual war was for this right here, for our mind. Because the devil knows if I can hold your mind hostage, I got your whole life hostage. And if I got you, if I got you thinking my thoughts, I can get you doing my deeds. And so they got us. You see what it did to us this year? They got us by fear. They didn't get us by, by actual evidence.